Hey, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to uh, episode 62 of Dads and Ed. If you notice, it's a little lonely here. I will uh, let the, I won't throw the guys under the bus right now, especially because Devin just walked in. Uh, but uh, I'm excited to be here. I was gonna I was gonna row the boat all by myself, but uh, I now that I have a little little helping hand. We're uh, we're good to go. Uh, my name is Josh Allen, tech integration specialist at Lewis Central. Four wonderful kids, beautiful wife. Excited to see you, Devin. Yeah, isn't this great? This is awesome. <laughs> it's wonderful. <clears throat> oh my goodness! So you just you know. Some things just don't want to work, but that's okay. That's okay. Um, I, yeah, I didn't, is, yeah, I didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. I, I, that's I, good. No, I'm not going to say anything either. Okay. All right. Go ahead. I'm not going to say anything either because I know that Bill Little is listening, or at least will <laughs> listen. And, oh, I think he's uh, live tonight. I will never hear you. <laughs> uh, Devin Schoding, K-12 Instructional Technology Program Lead or something in Council Bluff Schools in Council Bluffs, Iowa. Uh, my two wonderful children, Grace and Claire, uh, my wonderful wife. Uh, so yeah, it's I'm excited to be here. Uh, I was trying to get some things done. My my dad moment of the week is going to come from a conversation that happened uh, just a little bit ago with my kids, and that's why I was kind of short getting in here. And then uh, you know I came in here and nothing worked. So it's been awesome. That's the way it goes. I uh, you know today I actually you know you got to have a little adapter for your iPad to play on a uh, uh -huh. on a projector. Uh, of course, I left it on the other side of the building in a different room uh, when I was trying to do breakout EDU. So kids are all excited. I got to go find the stupid thing. So I understand yeah. it's the way things go. You know, it happens. That's fine. What are you going to do? Yeah, you know. Uh, you'll notice Bill Little's boss is a little late. So, Bill, uh, you can show up 15 minutes late tomorrow morning. I'm getting, I'm, I'm guessing. Uh, not yeah, I, I think, yeah, that's on good authority. I mean, I think we. <laughs> We make decisions by proxy for the independent school district uh, <laughs> if he's not here. <laughs> oh, I hope one of us has a job for him. He might need it after that. <laughs> uh, if you uh, would like to connect with the show, uh, feel free to uh, tweet at us, at Dads and Ed. Uh, use the hashtag Dads and Ed. That is uh, already hopping. Uh, Joey Kirkland's in the house. Matt Miller gave us a shout-out, former guest. Uh, the yep. aforementioned Bill Little, I believe, is, uh, is around. Uh, and that's used all the time. You use it in between shows. We encourage that. Love to see what you guys are doing. Uh, if you missed part of the show, uh, oh, one other thing. So if you're watching on YouTube, there's a little comment box. Uh, shoot us a comment. I put something in there. Uh, if you got a question for our guest, AJ Giuliani, fantastic guy. Yep. Uh, pop that in there, and uh, we're we're trying to keep track of that as well. So uh, trying to to find different ways to connect. Uh, if you missed part of the show, you can check out our website, dadsanded.podbean.com. Subscribe in iTunes or Google Play. Just do a search for Dads and Ed. And uh, we're also a proud member of the Edu Podcast Network. Good home for us. We, we enjoy it. Lots of great stuff going on there. Check them out at uh, edupodcastnetwork.com. And I think I so saw Devin, Chris, Chris Nassi just uh, said, hey, howdy, in the uh, YouTube stream. So there you go. Nice. Chris, the boss. That's right. uh, Joey Kirkland's in. Uh, nice. Yes, Chris Nessie is the uh, Edu Podcast. I don't know, but uh, uh, Czar is a little harsh. Czar, I don't yeah. want to. We love it, so Czar may be a little, maybe a little <laughs> rough. But uh, anyway, sure what uh, yeah, Chris, what the official title would be? I'm not sure, but Chris, Chris, <laughs> type your title into the comment. We uh, we don't know what we're supposed to call you, Czar Nessie. <laughs> oh, that doesn't really have a great ring to it, but uh, we'll we'll figure something out. Uh, so we chief. are editor in chief. Oh, commander in oh, he chief. Says, he says Lord. So we can go with that. Oh, that was pretty close. To Lord what we had. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit more medieval than what we were going for, but hey, it's all good. All right, Lord Nessie. Thanks for uh, keeping tabs on us and, and, and check it in this evening. Uh, so we are uh, <laughs> smack dab in the middle of, uh, of the transition period with college football. Uh, we have ended the regular season. Uh, I believe uh, today is the 12th, 11th, 12th. Mm -hmm. So I think the first mm -hmm. bowl is like two days away, which, goodness gracious, is, uh, that's how you know you have too many bowls. Um, but uh, last week it was announced that uh, you have Alabama 
as number one in the college football mm-hmm. playoff. Uh, number two would be the uh, Clemson Tigers. Uh, number three would be the Ohio State Buckeyes. Number four would be your Pac-10 champs, Washington Huskies. First of all, we could debate all day about who should be four, who should be five, should we have an 18 playoff. Uh, are you good with the top four? Yeah, you know, I am good with that top four, um, I guess. The the one thing that's been odd for me this year is I've kind of made this, this – uh, decision that I, I haven't watched nearly as much college football this year as I have in the past. And I've watched almost zero NFL football. Um, I kind of, you know, while I keep tabs on it and watch a, a little bit, I've kind of moved my, my sports watching into two areas. I'm going to be a big baseball fan and a big college basketball fan and, and college football and, uh, and pro football have kind of dropped a little bit, but that being said, I've watched enough to, to kind of, uh, Keep tabs and yeah, I, I'm good. I'm good with that top four. Um, the only team that I think has a case, right, is the big, right? Yeah, I I can see that. Is there anybody else that really has a a case? I mean, I, I've always been in favor of a of an expanded playoff, one that's closer to eight teams. Um, but if it's going to be four. I think I'm good with everybody, and and maybe I could hear the case of the Penn State folks. That would be my push for the eight. Would be you could have the Power Five champs in, um, yeah. and then you have the others. Um, I I think the the Penn State Ohio State is a, is a tough discussion because I I don't think many people would argue that Ohio State is a worse team than Penn State. Right. No. The reality is Penn State won. And yeah. it's kind of like grades. You know what? <laughs> you may be uh, smarter than me, but I got a better grade on the test than you did. <laughs> so, right. you know, I I don't know. It's tough. Um, I, I don't think there's ever going to be a, uh, a perfect system because no. you're going to complain about eight and nine and then, and then does Western Michigan – do they should they be in and yeah I I don't know well and I think I you know my my view is probably skewed on the fact that I think that the NCAA tournament men's basketball is probably the best uh, postseason uh, of any uh, and that's just not doable with football um, you know just but can't. I think the argument can be made if you have eight essentially that's what you get because you got the thirty two at large or thirty two yeah. conference champs if you put yeah. the power five in. I, in basketball, there's so much more parity than I think there is in football. You, it's a much easier for a team to get upset in the yeah. basketball tournament than than in the football tournament. So right, and, and I take the basketball when you know somebody like like Wichita State making it to the Final Four a few years ago. It would be really hard for a school like that in football to make it to a Final Four, Final Two game. So I suppose you know they they are completely different. I just you know, I think that, you know, the, the other parallel I think I hear people talk about is, you know, with the NFL, you know, in the NFL, you have to win your, win your division, you know, you have to win your division to win your conference, and then you get to the Super Bowl. Um, and could you do something like that with, with college football where, you know, you make the season worthwhile still, yeah. but, you know, I've got to win my conference, um, you know, or win the division that I'm in to, to get to my conference title. That could be a playoff game in itself to get to that next round. So, you know, I, I maybe see that closer than, than the NCAA tournament, uh, that men's basketball tournament, but uh, it certainly seems like it needs something. I, I don't like that it's just chosen sometimes. You know, it's, there's yeah. no real rhyme or reason as to why you get into that Final Four. I think that's one of the, the problems you ran into this year is what the arguments you would make for a team like a Washington Mm-hmm. You weren't making that same argument for Penn State. Right. And the same argument that you were making for Michigan couldn't be applied to a, a Wisconsin or something like that. So you really just right. like a dog chasing its tail after a while. It's just yeah, not going to work. So Yeah. And I think once people have an idea of who teams are, so like uh, Ohio State, you know, have a pretty good idea of who Ohio State is. One loss doesn't hurt them the way one loss hurts somebody else because we have this kind of predetermined understanding of, of who Ohio state is. Um, so I, I think that's, I don't know. I just don't love that part of, of the way college football has always run. I mean, it's always been that way to, to some degree. So. 
Yeah. Joey Kirkland chiming in on uh, on YouTube, uh, liking the idea of eight, uh, doable with how long it takes between conference championship and the final game. And yeah, I would agree with yeah. that. It's a long That's time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and you saw it actually really this weekend with Army Navy. Uh, you know, Navy or yeah, Navy, had, because they played the conference championship, they played eight weeks in a row. I mean, that's just it's crazy. Right. Yeah, totally agree. But there is just so, – so you understand people getting tired at that point, but then you have three, yes. four month, three, four week break. So Right, yeah, and I agree with that. I mean, and, you know, football is different than, than lots of sports, and that's probably why I've moved away from it a little bit, I suppose. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I suppose you could shorten that up just a bit. Uh, we'll give a shout-out. We got a new listener. Uh, Lee, Lee, man, Lee, I'm just going <laughs> to – listen, it's not you. It's me, buddy. I'm not good with names. Arat? A-R-A-O-Z. Arat. Oh, wow. Really? <laughs> man. Hey, I, you know what? Go check him out. At Lee, A-R-A-O-Z. <laughs> uh, we're in K-12 Coordinator of Instructional Technology. It's a good dude. We're following him on Dads and Eds, so you can just go check out our follow list. Uh, if I can get the button to work right. Yeah. Adam Sometimes Long, that follow Island, button. Uh, he Sounds needs to like phonetically that. phonetically spell that name somewhere so we can uh, <laughs> yeah. arouse. I told you. See that? I knew it was arouse. Okay. All there right. Go. My bad. Or arouse. Right. Chris hmm. Nessie. Chris Nessie knowing how to spell. Look at That's why he's Lord Nessie. That's why he's Lord Nessie. That's right. <laughs> that's how you get it. We'll never question it again. <laughs> 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 oh, all right. Moving on. Uh, Dab- oh, one other thing I want to say real quick. I am totally intrigued by Florida football right now. <laughs> if you look at the state of Florida, you have Jim McElwain. Yep. You have Jimbo Fisher. Yep. You have uh, my guy, Scott Frost, mm-hmm. Nebraska guy, Oregon offensive coordinator, coaching now at Florida uh, International. You now have Charlie Strong, who got fired at Texas and went yep. down to South Florida. You've got Mark Rick who went to Miami last year yeah. and announced today Lane Kiffin getting that. a third chance, third time's a charm, right? He's not going to screw this one up, right? No, I'm sure. I'm sure uh, we'll see. Yeah, well, we'll see. Uh, is now at Florida Atlantic. Uh, just a mad uh, – t- talk about it. That state's tough Ooh. enough yeah. to recruit in. Yeah. Man. Well, I've always – you know, I, I'm a Florida fan. I always have been University of Florida football fan. Um and yeah, just really hard to even recruit, you know, when you've got other schools coming in, but just those coaches alone in that state, man, that's got to make it really hard to recruit. Yeah. There, it was, there's a lot of interesting discussion about uh, Scott Frost and uh, that's, that's a great area for young coaches to get started in. Was there, I didn't read, but was there ever talk about him going back to Oregon once that job opened up? Well, I, yes and no. Um, Someone said once, I guess he came out and said that he wasn't going to take the $40 million contract that they offered him. And uh, someone pointed out that they weren't quite sure he ever got offered a contract for $40 million. (laughs) So uh, I think there was some discussion, but uh, I don't don't know how serious it was. I don't know about that job. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. The other last question or last thought about your comment about all those Florida coaches, because I agree. Is there anybody easier to root against than Lane Kiffin? No, I don't think so. I don't think so either. How, I think what? he's the most easily easy guy to root against of anybody I've ever seen. Maybe if if you if he's not your coach, what's your, I mean, he has made so many major fan bases mad. I mean, <laughs> USC, Tennessee, the Raiders. The Ra- I mean, <laughs> it's like a who's who of who you've ticked off. <laughs> fantastic no he's he is just seems like a terrible terrible person <laughs> <laughs> oh all right dad moment of the week so i uh i mentioned a couple weeks ago that uh we had uh done i think i mentioned a couple weeks ago we made some uh, homemade christmas decorations around mm-hmm. the house and uh getting a little pinteresty around here and uh we actually spent the weekend uh prepping a, a couple uh christmas presents for decorations so I have done more painting in the last couple of weeks, uh, uh-huh. not on a house wall, uh, than I have in quite a while. So, it, uh, you know, it, it's pretty funny when uh, my kids look to me for design ideas 
And I'm just like, I, I don't know. Let's try this. Let's just see what works. Like, we didn't spend a lot of money on it. It's all good. We'll uh, right. see. It's going to come from the heart. It's going to be the thought that counts. <laughs> so don't be alarmed. If you get a Christmas present you don't like, it's just because it's the thought that counts. <laughs> well, it's good for you, though. You know, good for you for taking on those projects. Yeah, we'll see about that. We'll see what other people well, my, think about uh, that. Uh, my dad moment of the week, like I was mentioning in the opening, is uh, it kind of just happened a few minutes ago. But we've had, you know, my my girls are ten and twelve; they're in fifth and seventh grade. And um, Gracie, who's in seventh grade, uh, found out about Santa when she was in first grade. Right? She and we're not going to lie to her; we're not going to tell her something that's not true necessarily. She's we just kind of turned around. a good and, time. If hold on, hold on. Uh, if, oh, if you're yeah. listening or listening to the podcast, now might be a With good time for your, to put earmuffs or ear, headphones in. That's true. I should have said that. We should have had like a warning signal of some kind. Um, but anyways, well, back then she asked, you know, and we said, well, what do you think? And, and her response was kind of like, I mean, so what you're saying is this guy comes into our, I mean, she wasn't buying it, right? So she's known for a long, long time. Claire, on the other hand, has has really believed and that's great. You know, we've we've tried to make sure that she does and and Gracie has kept up a good, um, good act, making sure that her sister believes as well. And, and as we got into this year, we, we started talking and, and we kind of, you know, I think Claire continued to want to believe, but was really had some doubts. Um, and so Aaron, my wife and I were laying with Claire tonight. We were just kind of talking about it and, you know, kind of feeling it out, seeing what she's thinking. And, and, uh, you know, I think it comes out that she doesn't. She knows that it's it's kind of not true. Um, but we ask her, you know, do you think do you think Gracie believes? And Claire looks at us just deadpan and says, deeply. She deeply believes in Santa. <laughs> and Aaron and I just both start dying because we're like, wait a second. Your sister's been keeping up an act for like six years uh, to make sure you get it. And, and uh, yeah, so Claire Claire believes that 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 Gracie believes deeply in Santa Claus because uh, she's been keeping up this act with her for the last six or seven years. So we thought that was pretty great today. (laughs) That is fabulous. We, uh, we are at that stage where that discussion may happen yet this year. Really? We'll have to see. Yeah. Uh, We actually, one of the neighbors is a year older and is still believing. So uh, we haven't, we haven't needed to yet, but yeah, we certainly weren't pushing it, but it was becoming more and more clear that she, uh, uh, while she wanted to continue to believe, I think she she knew uh, deep down that there's something fishy going on. <laughs> <laughs> that common sense kicks in. Yes, that's right. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are pleased to uh, welcome in the Dads and Ed uh, studio, AJ Giuliani. AJ is brought to you this week by SpaceX. SpaceX designs, manufactures, and launches the world's most advanced rockets and spacecraft. So when you are ready to take your own school to Mars, hopefully SpaceX will be ready to take you. Learn more at SpaceX.com. AJ, welcome to the show. What's up, fellas? How you guys doing? Yeah, I'm doing great. Well, you, you know, know, SpaceX. That's a, that's a pretty good sponsor, you guys. We're, we're pulling in for, for this episode. We are uh, my it's unofficial. Favorite. My favorite part of the show now is to watch our uh, our guest's face as Josh does that little intro with the fake uh, so good with the fake sponsor because he was just like yeah okay all right it's good That's though we should be space it would be awesome yeah, yeah we, that would be perfect <laughs> I I actually have to write it out and I can't look at you when I do it because I will start laughing. <laughs> I have tried to wing it a couple times. Like we started this a couple years ago. Like I don't know if it was like our first couple shows, but um, I did my dad's funeral home one time, and uh, we had Shaylin Farnsworth on, and I found like this random, like she lives in a small town, so like there's like one restaurant in town, so I had that. <laughs> and like afterwards, I'm like, is that place even open? Like it, it showed up in the Google search, but. It's, it's no, I can't. Ed, Dad's and Ed has a solid research base behind it. <laughs> we do. <laughs> solid. Like, like your R&D team is just intense. <laughs> That's why there's only two of you right now. There's just like <laughs> 10 of you that are R&D right now. Yes. Brent, yeah. Brent is, Even Brent, Brent is off. Yeah. <laughs> he is actively searching out new sponsors. He has to in order to keep it up. <laughs> we got to keep, 
Yeah, we uh, yeah we're active because we've got such a budget that we have to meet every year. So <laughs> Devin can have batteries and stuff like that. That's right. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> AJ, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I'm a dad. You know, cool. And, you know, and, I'm, and I'm in education, so I got both of those things going yeah. for me. <laughs> How we roll. <laughs> uh, I got four kids. Two nice. girls, two boys, seven, five, two, and one. One's uh, sick right now. Not, well, maybe two are sick right now. And, uh, you know, we're, we're not sure. Maybe three. I don't, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see what happens by the end of the night. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I live, I live in Pennsylvania, right outside Philadelphia. Been uh, kind of born and raised here, like Will Smith, all my life. And, uh, and I, I work at a school district, a public school district. I'm the director of tech and innovation was a former middle school and high school English teacher. So I still got into my blood and I, I coached football and lacrosse for seven years, but now I'm doing that administrative thing. I'm coaching my kids. So I, I kind of missed that piece, but I've uh, written a couple books. I blog, uh, you know, I'm just a dad in education. So, so a little your, bit just with, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Josh. Uh, real quick. Is your job new? Um, Did you just switch? Yes, in so, August. I was in a Go Open meeting the other day, and this girl introduced herself. <laughs> She's like, this is my first day. I took AJ Giuliani's job. And I'm like, oh, hey, welcome to the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was at Upper Perk before for two years, and we were one of the uh, the first six Go Ambassador districts at Upper mm-hmm. Perk. So. Um, it was an awesome district. It was a it was a fifty minute commute from my house. Mm-hmm. Probably the, a big reason I switched jobs. Now I got like a ten minute commute. Again, being a dad in education, uh, that stuff matters. Absolutely. Well, just mention, you know, you got four kids. You said under seven or or under, and you mentioned kind of coaching your kids. And can you talk a little bit about about that whole thing? We we've, we've talked a lot about um, coaching our kids. And, and kind of doing some of those things with our kids. Talk about coaching your kids after having been a coach of, of sports and other people's kids for a long time. Yeah, so I, I'm, I seem laid back right now. Maybe not. I got a nice beard going. It's not like Josh's beard, but it's a solid beard fest going. And I, I do have an American flag, because so that's kind of intense as well. So maybe I'm not that <laughs> laid back. Is um, your but, Budweiser sitting off to the side too? Yeah, but I mean, Peyton Manning couldn't get paid for it, so I'm not even bringing it in the screen. <laughs> Um, but, but honestly, I was a middle school football coach. And when I tell you I was the most serious middle school football coach, like this this God's honest truth. I was the most serious middle school football coach. We, uh, I coached four years, middle school football. We only lost one game, We won four league championships. And I treated that like it was, I was Alabama. Like, like, no, no lie. Like it was two a days. It was, it was serious. Our staff, right? I don't know if you guys coach middle school sports or not, but you get you're lucky to get like two people on the staff. I had I had my my buddy that I taught with, who was an assistant coach, and then I had my two brothers and my three brother in laws and one of my best friends from high school. We had a nine person staff <laughs> for middle school football. <laughs> True story. So so I get out I get out of coaching that and now I'm coaching my daughter's seven year old soccer league. And, you know, the commissioner of the soccer league is stacking his team. So, obviously, there's going to be some words exchanged. And uh, it, it, it's tough. It's, it's tough coaching your own daughter. I actually coached yeah. my, my daughter in T-ball. And she freaked out at me two games in. I stopped coaching. This is my first attempt coaching her again. But it, it went really well. So, <laughs> it's a lot different than coaching other people's kids. <laughs> You got nine coaches on your seven-year-old soccer uh, team too? No, no. It was no. pretty much solo oh, dolo. Man. Yeah. <laughs> I, had, I had another dad helping me out. I just – I wasn't proud. I wasn't proud of my previous <laughs> my previous experiences. I mean, we well, played – I coached I coached weighted ball, and literally there was fights, like, between coaches before the games because <laughs> – these kids would be weighing too much, but the coaches still want them to play. Wow. I mean, it was it was intense fo- football out here in Pennsylvania. Yeah, that that's how Dan Marino got to be Dan Marino, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> that's how we do it. 
Well, I I am uh, actively coaching my kids too. In fact, we got just done, just got done with basketball practice tonight, and uh, I I did not I did not have a lot of uh, I coached volleyball for a year. Actually, I coached I got to coach my sister for a year, and uh, that's pretty much my only non rec uh, uh, experience. But definitely, we actually switched leagues. Like we have the Y League and we have the City Rec. Oh. And uh, the why was like much more like intense for second grade basketball, and I'm like, <laughs> no nah, man, like come on, <laughs> this is ridiculous. So, but you get what you get with rec, so uh, it's fun. I, I I do enjoy it. I know uh, Clay Reisler was on a couple weeks ago, and he goes, he said, uh, you know, I learned that we don't talk on the way home from games. <laughs> <laughs> We, we let, that's a cooling off period. Of course. Of course. Do you realize that there's no medium ground though? So there's either leagues that like kids are like picking their nose in the corner or there's leagues where dads are fighting after the game. Yeah. Like there's right. no, there's no in between when it comes yeah, I, to youth sports. Like that's yeah. it. Right? There's not. It is. <laughs> it, it really is too bad because I think that's, that's, you know, parents seem to think that their kids are like the next Jordan and Tiger Woods and I just I laugh when uh, I, uh, the guy that lives behind us is an assistant basketball coach at the high school and like he just shakes his head he's like I, who do these kids think they are and parents really <laughs> yeah. more parents <laughs> yeah um, hey you mentioned uh, author uh, one of your recent books is a launch using design thinking to boost creativity and uh, bring the maker out of uh, every student with former dads and ed guest, uh, John Spencer. So that book is one that is uh, on, has been cracked open, and I am uh, working my way through it. Uh, where did that idea come from for, uh, for launch? Sounds like my Budweiser right now. <laughs> cracked open and ready to go. Yeah, working my way Let's through Let's do it. <laughs> um, you know, I got a chance to collaborate with John a couple of years ago and he's just a really smart dad in education. You know, he's like a really, he's a cool dude. And, um, we'd always been, been talking about writing a book together. <clears throat> and we also were talking about design thinking a lot. And this book just came out of like the same thing that we got in our positions, which is like all these teachers or even parents like wanted to do creative stuff with their kids, but they thought like creative stuff was like, finger paint because mm -hmm. you, you can't like be creative unless like there's paint and like crap everywhere. So <laughs> what we basically said was like all these companies, right? Like Facebook, Google, all these companies use the same process, design thinking to be creative. And by the way, great teachers, good teachers, we all use it too in the classroom, mm -hmm. but like what would it look like to write a book that structured creativity uh, for the K through 12 space. So that's what, that's what this book was all about. It was kind of like a uh, build out of our own frustration and then our own talking with each other about our process and, um, and kind of just picked up there. So it really is a, a framework for creativity, for lack of a better term, uh, for, for K through 12. Yeah, and you know, I, I read it too and loved it. I think I, I even, um, we had a little conversation about it on, on Voxer, but you know, the, the great thing I think about it, and you, you kind of just mentioned it, is it's a process that I think uh, most people are aware of. They don't know how to label it, right? They're, they don't know the, the terms, if you want to call them the appropriate terms for it. But, you know, I know I shared something with, with John recently. We had a, a parent uh, group getting together. We were, we were kind of talking about relationships in our schools and how to build better ones. Uh, and took all these parents through a design thinking activity that was, you know, it's very similar. And, and I think what, what you mentioned is true, and I'd like to hear more about it. Like, it really is a process that, that we use in, in lots of, of phases of our life. It's not just an opportunity to create a product. It's not just a teaching, you know, a, a method or a strategy for, for kind of teaching. It's something you use all over the place. Yeah, I mean, it is it is used all over the place, right? So, like, uh, we call it the, it's the design thinking, we call it the launch cycle, just a mm -hmm. catchy name, and in education, you have to have acronyms. Like, if you don't have an acronym, it doesn't matter in education. Right. So, yeah. obviously, we had to come up with an acronym. John's <laughs> a nice artist, so he could draw some, some sketchy stuff, and mm -hmm. uh, the kids love it, as they say. So, <laughs> um, but, 
it's the same thing, right? You look at like the engineering design process. You look at the scientific method. Um, you look at like how you do your laundry. It's the design thinking process. Like it's the same thing um, where you start with really trying to figure out what's the problem. Like right. listen to the people learning, and then you ask a bunch of questions so you can dig down deeper into what the issue is until you finally understand really what the issue is. Most people don't do those first three steps. Right. They're just like. I know what the issue is. I, I know what the problem is. I'm just going to go, right? And so they, they miss that. And then it's, it's creating, it's, it's brainstorming. The key piece that we put on to, to ours is that once you have made something, you should share it with a larger audience, like something that's authentic instead of just making like digital fridge art. Right. You know, like, like everybody using like, let's use Glockster and then, yeah. and then what, right? You're like, I don't, I don't know what, right? So, so doing something um, that has meaning in and outside of school. Yeah. And, and I would say that one we did with, with parents, you know, when we were defining the problem. It was, it was really an interesting process for them to go through with, with thinking about like, Oh, I didn't think of it, you know, as a, as a problem, didn't think of it as, as creating solutions. You know, we weren't there just looking for the right answer to, you know, how do we build better relationships with our, with our parents and our families and our communities. It really was this idea of let's, let's uh, look at what the problem is and how do we, uh, how do we get to a solution? But, with that, I know one other question about the book. Can you talk about the process of writing, uh, writing a book like that um, with two authors and you guys aren't living anywhere near each other, uh, but going through that whole process of, of writing that book, uh, you know, not, not ever really getting together to write it? Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> they talk about like technology with a purpose. That's exactly it, right? You know? um, John and I did a podcast together, much like you guys are doing, and we never even saw each other. I've only met John face to face one time and we've done multiple collaborative projects together. Um, for that process of writing that book, um, the, the nice thing is that when you find somebody you can work with collaborative, and you guys know this, a lot of times your strengths aren't the strengths of the other person. And there's like, mm -hmm. I can't draw for crap. Like, <laughs> like I, I, I'm telling you, I, I, like even a stick figure, I'd be embarrassed to draw a stick figure right now if you, if you wanted me to do that. I, I wouldn't do it, right? Like the legs would be too long, the arms are – I'm a 5'7 Italian guy. I got no chance of drawing something <laughs> proportion, right? It's just going to – and so a lot of John's like creative talents and artistic talents uh, kind of met with like marketing and different type of like packaging stuff that I like doing. And so we just fed off each other, you know, and that was exciting because – it weren't, wasn't ideas competing for each other. It was, it was kind of a nice mm -hmm. mesh of those ideas. And it, it only took us probably three, four months to write the book, mm -hmm. but that was kind of our focus for those couple months. And it was just, it, it's getting the thinking out into the, out into the page, you know? And, uh, and then we published it with Dave Burgess, which was awesome. Those guys do a great job of like kicking out a book a week, it seems like. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> You know, um, so we, we joined the pirate family, as they say. It was, it was weird. There was a weird initiation. I won't go into it here. It's not safe for kids. Uh, maybe in your, your other hour, we could talk about it. Fortunately, we didn't have to do that with Lord Nessie, but uh, when we joined the Edu Podcast Network. But speaking of uh, your, your projects, I know you guys have a new one going on about a, a challenge to Mars, which I, uh, I, was late in sending it to uh, one of our uh, one of our teachers, but he is uh, definitely on board with uh, with doing it after the fact. But talk a little bit about your uh, your Mars challenge, which prompted us to have SpaceX as our sponsor tonight. I, I can't believe it. I can't wait to even meet Elon Musk. This is going to be fantastic. Um, so it's part of the after party, exactly. And in which case, I'll bring the story of the initiation into uh, <laughs> Dave Burgess Consulting, the firm. All right, so. Um, the, the big thing that, that we did last April, actually, last April, we held a global day of design. It was like one of those ideas you just throw out there on a blog and you see if it sticks, it's, it's stuck. There was 40,000 students, over 400 schools that took part in this global day of design. Think of like our code, but for making and design thinking, right? And also not by some big company, just by two random dudes or dads in education. So we did that. People love the challenges. And um, it, was, it was just fun, right, to, like, see the, the Twitter, you know, stream of kids just making stuff. And so we were thinking, like, oh, what should we do? Like, during December, so many people just don't do anything. They're going to, like, watch movies, 
right? You know, I, look, I'm guilty as charged right here, you know, of, of doing that type of stuff as a teacher. So what if we did like a little challenge during some of those dull December days and uh, Mars has been getting a lot of publicity is that show on National Geographic, which I'm not sure if I like, but I still keep watching. And, um, and then, and, and so we came up, came up with like, let's do a challenge for Mars, designing your own school there. Again, one of those things, just put it out there. We now have got um, over 10,000 students participating and 300 different classrooms. So there's going to be an award. There's going to be, a, we have some judges. There's K through two, uh, three through five, six through eight, nine through 12. Uh, going to give out some, some challenge stuff and they have to submit before the uh, first of the year. So it's, it's awesome just seeing like, like people want to do this stuff, but often they need that little spark. That's like, here's a lesson plan. Here's a unit plan. Here's the PowerPoint that goes with it. Here's a sketchy video that introduces it. Here's the connection to the standards. You got all your backup go. And that's, that's what these challenges are. Well, I think so often like teachers are still used to, having like, uh, you know, uh, off reading out of a book or, you know, that everything's scripted for them. So I, I think the way you guys have it set up is great in that, yes, there is some sort of launch point uh, for them, but it's completely wide open. And, and yep. what the kids are going to come up with, you know, it's not a recipe to steal, uh, you know, a Chris Lehman term, but uh, it's, it's definitely, they can make it their own. Yeah, and that's, I mean, I can't tell you how many emails I'll get from teachers being like, can we add this? Yes. Can we, can we, yeah. Can we use spray paint? Yeah. Right? Like, that's the point. Actually, <laughs> yes. SpaceX said that's not allowed. So, right. That's my <laughs> next email back. So <laughs> they, uh, they are an unofficial sponsor. Kind of got to be careful. <laughs> Elon said no. <laughs> no. <laughs> right. He's not going to make money off that. So we can't do that. Exactly. <laughs> so it's it's fun. It's going well. I'm excited to see like the people are always starting to turn in stuff, and the uh, the hashtag Mars Challenge on Twitter is starting to blow up with people doing stuff. So it's it's just fun to see you know people getting creative. Looked like I was waiting to see Brett. Looked like he was going to jump in. Sorry, I was. Yeah, I apologize, guys. I'm That's being okay. tardy, and AJ, it's good to meet you virtually, and. Uh, you know, apologize for being tardy. One of my principals I work with here, AJ, said to our, uh, say hello because he's using your resources for Genius Hour, which I was trying to catch up here in the conversation. But, you know, I'm hearing you guys talk about design thinking and Genius Hour and those sorts of things. So let's say that you're on Mars and you're hosting your first PD. Uh, how do you explain to them why those things are important in schools? Um, first of all, you have a giant clock behind you, dude. How are you tardy? That's yeah, you know, <laughs> good, good question, brother. <laughs> Life's happening today, that's for sure. Yeah, I'm with you. Um, so, I, I mean, if I'm if I'm doing something like that on Mars, first off, I'm like, we're on Mars. Like, let's just <laughs> like let's have a good time. But I think the whole point of the school challenge was to say, like, if if you didn't have governments deciding and 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 states deciding mandates and stuff like that, well, like, what parts of school would you bring and what parts would you be like no we don't really really need that that type, type of piece and for me um, i always come back to learning starts with attention right like you can't learn something unless you're giving attention to something and normally you get attention for two ways either you're interested in something or it's out of necessity like a tiger is chasing you or you burn your hand on the stove or somebody says you got a quiz tomorrow but after a while in school, necessity just gets old because it's not really necessary that you pass that quiz tomorrow. Like some people buy into it, but most people don't. But interest never gets old because if you're bored, it's because you're boring, right? It's, it's, your, it's your interest. So I would firmly say that professional development, professional learning should be driven by interest. More student learning should be driven by interest. Obviously, there's the basics, the fundamentals, the first principles uh, you got to learn. but I'm, I'm really uh, kind of focused and always have been on the piece that if you can grab kids' attention, and, and normally if you can grab their attention by them wanting to give you attention, you've already won 75% of the learning battle. Mm -hmm. You know, AJ, uh, I was going to mention, we've talked a lot about the, the books and the challenges. Your blog is, is uh, one of my favorite ones to read. I think that you post some things there that are very 
um, they're provocative, that encourage conversation and dialogue. Um, tell me how you go through the process. How often do you want to blog? Do you blog as often as you like? Do, is it something where you, you know, I know some people try and schedule it out. I'm going to have a post out every, you know, two weeks or one week or month or whatever. What's, what's your process like for your blog? Because I really do appreciate your blog. Thank you. I, I appreciate you appreciating my blog. So we can, we can talk about that. We can, yeah, we should. <laughs> um, I write a thousand words a day. So mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of my thing. Um, started off like a hundred words a day and 200. It's been a thousand words a day for a while. I, I don't feel like it's <clears throat> too much, right? Normally I, I wake up early in the morning and I'll probably get all my writing and stuff done, you know, before I head out the door so that when I come back home, I'm just dad full time. Like I'm not, <laughs> You know, you guys are taking me out of dad mode, but my kids are asleep. Uh, but 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 most of the time, I get back home and I'm I'm not doing anything with work. It's all in the morning. So I, I write about a thousand words a day, whether that be books or courses or, or blog posts. And the the funny thing about that is, when you're writing that much, sometimes something good comes out. Most of the time, it's mm -hmm. not right. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of the time, it's crap. But sometimes something good can come out, and you throw that together. So I'm just—it's one of those things where, like, I can't commit to to walking on the treadmill for 30 minutes or running for 30 minutes, but I could write a thousand words, you know, in the morning. Right. So right. it's like it's one of those habits that I've I could build up over time. Um, and I love blogging. I think blogging is still highly underrated um, mm -hmm. in, in education. I think social media is way overrated. Mm -hmm. I would say Twitter is dead, but I'd have the Twitterati coming after me and I, I don't want to mess with people like that. But mm -hmm. really, if you, I, I'll be honest here. If you like, uh, got somebody with a hundred thousand Twitter followers and they send a tweet out, they've got maybe one retweet, maybe one comment. There's a hundred thousand mm -hmm. people you're supposed to be connecting with. And if you blog, you could blog to 10 people and get three comments, right? Mm -hmm. So like, what is, what's the engagement there, right? I think blogging is so much more powerful um, as a way to interact and communicate as an educator than, than social media. Mm -hmm. uh, I've struggled with blogging like <clears throat> in the realm of saying what I want to say. And so I, I agree with Devin. And when I've read some of your stuff, I always appreciate just the transparency of that, the honesty of it, you know, and, that's something that I'm striving for and I started my own little challenge of myself trying to blog once a week um, and throw something out there and just have this goal of that at the moment and trying to be a little less critical of what someone might think of what I've written. And, and I, cause I've bought, I've just had struggles with that internally, you know, more than anything. Um, but I love when, you know, this is something too, is funny hearing you talk about Twitter being dead or but just in general, the social media aspect of being able to share your thoughts. And I try to model in the social media that I use around, if I come across your blog, I think it's great. I'm going to share it out. And I don't see other people doing that like as much as I wish they would just from a positivity standpoint, right? Instead of it being all about them and what they want, you know what I mean? Like, because certain people like John Spencer, sorry, I've got kids running around here. That background noise is happening. I apologize. Uh, but, you know, guys that, again, that I, or gals that I look at and go, man, that's a great post, and they get a lot of good conversation going. And that's what I think is more powerful, right? And in, in that sense. And I know Devin did his year of, you know, being a father, and I, I love reading those and, and chiming in once in a while. And of course, I see him here, but. You know, anyway, so cool, just, you know what's cool about like Devin's post when he was doing that? And there's a big, there's a big distinction mm -hmm. is he was documenting, not necessarily creating. Mm -hmm. And I think so many people mm -hmm. get stuck in blogging because they try creating something. They try mm -hmm. doing like a five paragraph essay that we hated in high school and we hated in college. And now all of a sudden we're supposed to do that for writing? Like, no, mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we never like that. Mm -hmm. But I think what's so cool right. and powerful is like you're just documenting like, it's my journey. It's not hard to write about my truth. It's right. not hard to write about like what I, what I believe and what I'm going through. It's much harder right. to try to like come up with something witty or something that's mm -hmm. like profound. That's going to get, you know, like it, it's so much easier to just document because that's just who we are. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. And these, so I've literally written like two posts and I think that I'm trying to, to get at that. And, uh, Again, not worry about right, and I, it's been interesting to see some of the feedback I've gotten because of it. And and again, just not worrying about 
someone what they're going to say about it, you know, or think about it, I guess, versus just write what's on my heart. And if you get somebody saying something negative about it, it just means that they made an impact enough for them to care. Mm-hmm. I mean, honestly, there's going to be disagreements all the mm-hmm. time in, in education and in our country. So what, if you get negative feedback, I get negative feedback all the time. And most of the time, those people just want a conversation, right? Like they just yeah. like want to talk to somebody. So I don't I think it's always a bad thing. Um, but I, I love that idea of documenting first of just kind of document what you're doing. Like the same thing on Twitter. And I said Twitter's dead. I shouldn't have said that it's dead because <clears throat> there is like a really cool young group of like newer teachers that are using it and using it kind of the way a lot of people used it five years ago. And so there's, there's a continuum. I, I shouldn't say that because there is people that are using it to make connections and to, mm-hmm. to collaborate and all those different types of things. But when you see people using it to just share the same like regurgitated message in a different picture form, mm-hmm. that to me means it's dead because you're not bringing anything into the conversation. You're just bringing a fancier picture of the same quote that's been shared 2,500 times, right? right. Like that that yeah. doesn't do anything. Yeah, I'm totally it. with you there. I, I knew you didn't mean it in, in that other, but I appreciate you expounding on that. Pretty sure we had that discussion about that uh, post here on uh, here on Dads and Ed. Now that you mentioned that, I, I forgot we had to make that discussion. It's a, I mean, it's not a negative thing, right? But I, I don't know how many of your kids use like Instagram or Snapchat. They're not using Twitter, right? Right. Not many, right? Yep. Like, all my younger siblings, like Snapchat is probably my most used. Um, app on my phone because I have you know four younger siblings and my wife does and that's how we communicate with them right mm-hmm. like that's and there's no likes there's not there's there's nothing that you're reach like there's nothing there it's just all just communication there's no social proof I guess I would say no yeah that was if I remember correctly that was more the stance that we took we, we gave you a hard time about saying it was dead but it's all good <laughs> It could come back, <laughs> but it won't. Resuscitated. No. Guys, MySpace isn't dead either. There's still some people. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> still hanging we on. We have a lot on. of, uh, is it friends? I think we have a lot of friends on, on MySpace, if I remember correctly. <laughs> yeah. What was that one guy's name? John? Who was the first guy? Tom, right? Oh, it was Tom. Tom. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you're talking about writing and uh, I know that you're, you know, we've talked a lot about, you know, design thinking and, and you know, you talked about Genius Hour and what have you too. But, um, I, you're teaching a course in Genius Hour, correct? How is, explain like, uh, explain how that works. I, I'm assuming it's not going to be like they just, uh, this, so you're teaching it to teachers. Yes, yes, and no. Okay. And no. Uh, the teacher hey, part. <laughs> how about I skip like half of what I said and uh, hey AJ, tell us about your uh, genius <laughs> course. Um, so the, the cool thing about like blogging about the same topic for six years is is you start to get a lot of people asking you questions about it, right? You know, if you actually, mm-hmm. I, I've been blogging about Genius Hour for six years since I've done it, and I've had lots of other teachers that worked in my school districts doing it. I've I've gone and spoken to places. But I tell you what, so many people are like, I've read your book or I've read your blog post and it's cool, but I, I can't do it. Like I don't, mm-hmm. I don't have the time, I don't have the resources, all that kind of stuff. So I also, there's a whole host of, of teachers that <clears throat> just, just kind of like didn't want to do it or, or like wanted to call it Genius Hour, but just like chill at their desk and mm-hmm. not really do anything either, right? Um, <clears throat> and... And so I created a course, which is a completely self-paced course. It has a private Facebook uh, group where, where people talk and share out, right? Um, but the cool thing about the course is that it gives you lesson plans, unit plans, all the resources that you need, all those things straight out the box, 70 videos of me explaining all the different types of things. They're short, five-minute videos. And um, <clears throat> right now, I think... Over fifteen hundred people have taken the course, and the course the course costs money. So those people are serious, right? I guess that's what I'm getting at, right? Mm-hmm. It's I did a free course uh, on Genius Hour, and over twelve thousand people took the free course. It was short; it was only like four videos long. It jump started it. I can honestly say that 
more of an impact has happened with the 1500 people that have taken a paid course than the 12,000 people that took a free course. Cause when you do free stuff, you don't value it. And these people that are doing this, they value it. They're in the Facebook talking to each other, sharing wins and failures and what worked and what didn't and adding stuff to what I can put on the course. And so it's, it's really built like this community of people around this idea that are passionate about doing it for real and not just kind of like, eh, maybe I'll try it out, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, been, it's been really cool to see. I never thought launching it in August that we would have 1,500 people doing it, but it's awesome. That's very cool. Um, one of the things, AJ, kind of the, the crux of, of us doing this and, and putting together this podcast comes from, from this last question. Really, you know, we know how it's impacted us, but we're curious with the people we have on. Uh, if you could talk about how, you know, being a parent has impacted you as an educator and vice versa, you know, how has being an educator impacted you as a parent? <clears throat> so I was, uh, my, it's funny because I was thinking about this the other day as I was in an elementary classroom, a kindergarten classroom. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I've, I've one daughter's in second grade. My other son is going into kindergarten next year. And so you start seeing your kids in other kids, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I never did that before when I was teaching because I didn't have kids that age, right? I was teaching middle school or high school. But now I'm in these classrooms. And um, you, you start realizing that, every every kid in that classroom is like somebody else's whole life mm -hmm. right so like when i when i send my daughter to school this year she has a fantastic teacher she she couldn't be happier she's reading more like i like want to hug that person right you know like every day when she comes home and she's excited and jacked up about learning I, I'm like, should I like give her a tip, like 20 bucks? Like here, you know, like, but, but, but I'm like, why am I giving this waitress money who brought me my food, but the teacher who's like grooming my child, I can't, I can't give them something. Mm -hmm. And so I guess my, my perspective has changed as a parent because as a parent, you, you see every little thing, right? With a kid. Um, but being a teacher, it was hard to see every little thing. And so that relationship piece matters so much more. The, the whole like human social side of learning matters so much more. Mm -hmm. And so when, when I'm working, I, I'm a director of tech. I, I hardly ever talk about technology. Mm -hmm. I'm mostly talking about how you can use it to develop stronger social human bonds, how, why that's so important, you know, and, and going from that angle because I'm a parent. I think it's impacted me as a parent because I've, I've seen, I, I have a kid who, it was interesting, I taught eighth grade and then I move up to the high school. I taught this kid in eighth grade and in 10th grade and in 12th grade. And I coached him in football and I coached him in lacrosse, okay? Mm -hmm. In eighth grade, awful family life, he was in, the bottom of the class really struggled just just to just to do anything without getting in trouble right mm -hmm. i see him in 10th grade and he's in my academic level class but he's kind of got it together he's playing football at the high school he's gotten some you know he's hanging out with a different crowd i, I bump him up to honors in his 11th grade year his 12th grade year he becomes the salutatorian of the of the school he gets a uh partial ride to Penn State. He becomes <clears throat> the first freshman manager in Penn State football history um, and now is the full-time manager for Penn State football as a junior and interning at KPMG, one of the top accounting firms. And so when I see Keith on Instagram, because that's where I see him, right? I mean, honestly, I, I ran into to him like one time, but I see him on Instagram. I see his story. He follows me too, right? He sees my story. He's like, oh, your kid's growing up. Like, I remember when she was, when we were coaching, that type of thing. Like, that type of stuff matters so much more. Um, and that's kind of what I bring from, that, from the, the parent side um, back to it as the educator. So, um, but, but those stories matter like that's what you, that's what you're looking for you get a couple of those stories in your career um then it's all worth it and it's and, and i guess we miss that a lot when we're talking to new teachers 
we miss that a lot when we're trying to get the disgruntled 15 year old veteran to, to get fired back up for teaching. And we're like, let's get fired up because we're using Google Docs or, or maybe not, right? Like, let's get fired up because you could impact a kid's life and that kid might impact your life too. So to me, that two-way relationship, whether it's as a parent, right, because our kids impact us and we impact them, or as that teacher role where we impact them and they impact us, that to me is the, the similarity that I see between both. Well, AJ, we uh, really appreciate your uh, your time tonight. Um, we know you're on the East Coast, so I don't know if you need to get going. we got a couple other things that we need to do. Do you have time to stick around or do you need to get going? I'm going to get going. I was up to 2 o'clock last night doing dad things. My <laughs> furnace my furnace went out. So I was up to 2 o'clock last night. had guys here at the house putting in a new furnace. Um, so oh. I, I'm going to go to bed. I, mean, I'm just, 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 I, I have to, to say – uh, uh, Bob Dylan is uh, checking in. Uh, he is uh, appreciative you go in full American tonight. So, uh, uh, shall... did he, he missed the Budweiser though? So. He did. Yeah. <laughs> well, let, let's let's be honest. He missed the conversation. He probably didn't miss the actual Budweiser. But uh, anyway, AJ, we do appreciate you taking the time, Absolutely. and uh, we'll, we'll catch up with you on Twitter or somewhere else. Yeah, not Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll see you later. I'll catch you guys on Snapchat. Thanks, AJ. See you later. All right. <laughs> thanks, AJ. Thanks, AJ. All right, thanks to uh, to AJ for checking in. Uh, moving yeah. down uh, to uh, our uh, blog post article, it looks like book of the week, Mr. Catlett. The floor yes. is yours. Yes, sir. I'm gonna go with this one right here. You can't oh, see he, it. You brought it props, <laughs> but I did. Yeah, I just finished it up this uh, yesterday, actually. I guess so. This is Building School 2.0. Uh, how to Create the Schools We Need by Chris Lehman, former guest of just a few episodes back. Yeah. And Zach Chase is co-author here. So I know we were talking a lot to AJ about his book, which now I'm like, I can go get that one now because <laughs> I haven't read that one yet. Um, but I'm just chewing up books and love to read. And I think you guys will enjoy this one. It's kind of like 90-some little mini theses is how I mm -hmm. think he puts it. And I really like that setup because I love to be able to do, I'm going to do one more and then I'll quit, you know, for right now. And so there's sometimes just short little two page little thesis uh, statements written about all things education and how they do things at the SLA out in Philly. Uh, awesome book. I really enjoyed it. And, you know, kind of just uh, for me reaffirm some things I believe in and, and even just listening to AJ right now, I was just kind of nodding and agreeing with so much of his answer to our kind of, uh, trademark question mm -hmm. but um anyway i highly suggest it chris layman zach chase building school 2.0 very good you are you, like. your reading is out of control man well I mean, I, like, every time i open up instagram you're you got a new book that you finished yeah i know and i got a stack that i still got to get through then i keep getting these new ones i want to do and i'm like I don't know. It's funny since I started the doctorate, uh, which I have to read books for that. I find myself wanting to read something else that I wanted to read versus what this teacher told me to read uh, for a class, which I know sounds kind of funny. But anyway, yeah. so it's actually inspired me to read more. No, it really is because I, I feel like I want, you know, I, I read and I like to read and I want to read. But God dang it. Every time I turn around, it's like you have a new book read. So <laughs> I feel like I can't even say anything. It's like I can't keep up with Brent. So. <laughs> No, I, I, I just enjoy sharing them out for people to maybe, you know, if you grab one of them or something and, and I, and this kind of comes back to my blogging. I want to try to do a better job of, but I loved, I loved, man, I'm so glad I was able to make it. I know I was tardy and I apologize, but I, I think the listening to him talk about the blogging aspect for me was so helpful because I've thought about like, as I read through these, sometimes I'll highlight them, I'll fold the corner of the page. And I'll say, it, it'll hit me with something, right? And I'm like, I need to say something about it. So I've tried to just at least share them from a picture standpoint and say, hey, I read this. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I'm recommending it. Because there honestly have been a couple I haven't shared where I kind of like, eh, it didn't do much for me. I'm not really that behind it. But if I'm sharing the picture, like it's something that I endorse, so to speak, you know? And yeah. um, anyway. That's awesome. All right, my uh, video of the week. So for the longest time, uh, you know, we, we chatted about Santa earlier. Um, and uh, my dad, uh, even growing up, was one of Santa's helpers. Uh, he would walk uh, 
um, up and down the street and the at main street in the town that we lived in, handing out candy canes to people. And this was back in the uh, 80s when you could actually do that and people didn't freak out. And uh, so uh, I uh, saw this uh, news article and video today about a uh, Santa Claus um, who, who is legit, looks the part, does all that, mm-hmm. and uh, was able to grant a, a five-year-old uh, his last wish to see Santa uh, before he, uh, you know, unfortunately passed away. Um, it is a heart-wrenching story, um, as uh, you know, all of us have kids that are uh, very young, mm-hmm. and seeing them sick is one thing, and seeing them terminally ill is a completely different one. And uh, you know, my thoughts and prayers go out to the family. Um, you know, thank goodness that, uh, for uh, people like uh, this guy. Uh, so uh, check that out. I put it on the uh, Dad's and Ed hashtag um, for uh, for others to see. So, Mr. Shoning, time to drop yeah. the mic. All right. Uh, you know, the online world can be such a tough place to exist right now. Uh, the prevalence of political posts and opinions have done nothing but create tension in spaces like Facebook and Twitter. You know, the openness of the web has also empowered and emboldened people to say things publicly that they would have never said before. And I can see where people might see social media spaces as these kind of created safe spaces for the dissemination of hate. And even given all that, I believe more than ever that that we as parents and educators have an obligation to help young people understand how to more positively utilize these spaces. And to do that, we have to lean into these spaces and hold each other accountable for the things we say and do. So it kind of brings me to what I want to see as 2016 turns to 2017. You know, I want to see people take advantage of the amazing opportunity we've been afforded with social media spaces to connect with one another, to learn from and with one another, to start movements of love and not hate, and to be better listeners and more empathetic. And then to find those areas where we agree as opposed to just where we're divided. You know, that's kind of my wish as we turn to 2017. Well done. Uh, definite mic drop all right so we are uh, this is the end of 2016 uh, we is. will be back hey cat is that january 16th is that official i can announce that right yes we got coming up yes we will have the uh yeah gentlemen you know every now and then we get <laughs> we get to be kind of a big deal i mean aj was great January 16th, we were going to have Dr. Randy Watson, Commissioner of Education for the state of Kansas. Mm -hmm. Nice. That's pretty cool. Man, I might not have to wear a hoodie that night. (laughs) Get the the certain tile, you know. Yeah. No, you don't have to, but he's fantastic. I'm super excited for you guys to meet him and for him to share the stuff he's up to in the state of Kansas. Just really uh, admirable work. And, you know, I think that that guess that we can announce for the next one is awesome. And uh, without revealing anything else, I am really excited for what we have for the uh, second half of this year. Uh, it, just with the guests that we already know, kind of secretly, that we have confirmed for that second part of the year. Um, looking at a couple of guests that are maybe a little different uh, than what we've normally had. Um, and maybe even some new opportunities to hear some different voices. So... Uh, yeah, it's good to be able to announce that one officially, and, and I can't wait to to get after all the ones we've got for the second half of the year, too. Absolutely. Well, uh, for everyone, have a good holiday season. Uh, happy New Year, and uh, we will see you on January 16th. <laughs>